Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. WA Real brings you real and authentic stories from fascinating people here in Western Australia. Stories to inspire and guide you to take action to be all you can be. Today, my guest is Wayne Chase. Born in Victoria, Wayne moved to WA when he was 11. Wayne, like many, has worked in the public sector for over 20 years for a few different agencies in various roles. Never really career-minded and hating the routine of paper pushing and the monotony of of the working day in order to pay bills, being a dad became his purpose and doing everything possible to enable his sons to have amazing lives. Then on the 28th of December, 2016, his 15-year-old son, Mitchell, was involved in a motorbike accident that claimed his life. Rather than the grief and trauma from losing his son turning his heart to stone, it opened Wayne's mind to the suffering of others. Combined with receiving so much support, generosity and love, it gave him a boost and instilled in him the desire to use his experience to help others. Since then, Wayne has written the book All Heart, telling the story of Mitch's life, his journey through grief, and to assist anyone struggling with adversity. He's also created a Facebook page with the same name to give his thoughts on dealing with life's challenges. Wayne, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for having me. (laughs) So um, one of the questions I always ask guests at the start, because it is called WA Real, was um, you obviously came over here at the age of 11. Yep. um, From Victoria. How was, can you tell me much about why you came over and what that was like? Yeah, just when we were in Victoria, we were there, was just mum, dad, me and my brother. And um, my, my nan was there as well. And she didn't like the cold weather. So she moved to WA, she came for a holiday like the weather, she moved, and then we followed her over. So being a kid and only being 11, you don't have a say. You just follow along where your parents take you. So yeah. that was how I ended up here. What was the big – do you remember much about the shift and change? <laughs> now when I think back, I think, oh, my parents sold the house and they'll probably be listening to this. But uh, we came across by coach and it's two days and two nights. I think – they sold the house. Why didn't we fly? <laughs> Surely it was only a couple of dollars extra to fly and, you know, it's – Two days, two nights on a coach is a nightmare. You can't sleep. And so, yeah, that was my my one memory of and moving then, over. And then what about integrating into life here in WA? Um, I don't remember that it was oh, – I remember, do remember feeling that, you know, a bit sad as you're leaving, you're leaving your friends and everything that you know. But I think being a kid, you, you just adapt and uh, it doesn't take you too long, mm. especially, you know, uh, when I had kids, you see them at the playground with other kids that are, especially as toddlers, in two minutes and they've made best friends. So yeah. kids are quite um, resilient and adapt pretty easily. So it wasn't too much of a traumatic experience. So, yeah. There you go. So – Obviously, um, listen to the introduction, and we'll get further into the story in a minute. Obviously, listen to the, instru- the introduction. There's, there's a big part of you turning adversity into something quite incredible. Yeah. Um, is that something that was role modeled earlier in your life, or has that come about through this experience? Where does that come from? Um, that's a good question. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just for whatever reason, just, um, you know, generally an optimistic person. So, you know, you always try and look for, not that there's any positives, and even if there is, I'd give them all back to have Mitch back in my life, but um, just trying to keep going and and to find a reason to keep going and, yeah, just looking for some something to hang on to and some positive through, you know, unbelievable trauma and grief <clears throat> and pain. So, mm. yeah. So can you tell me a bit about, a bit, a bit, a bit about Mitch? Yeah, he was, um, he was so unique. He was just an incredible character. He had this real zest for life. Almost uh, every minute of every day was nonstop. Um, I've included in the book one moment that, you know, he'd been, already in and out doing different activities on one particular day. And I said to him, mate, it's okay, you can mid-afternoon. I said, you know, you've been busy all day. Why don't you just sit down for two minutes and watch a movie? And he looked at me with this just confused look on his face just and said, that's boring. I'm going for a ride. And he was off again. So every minute of the day he was, uh, he just loved life and threw himself into everything that he, um, that he was passionate about. Um, and when I was younger, I was, um, 
a lot more shy and quiet and, you know, fearful and, uh, and then little Mitch came along and he was the complete opposite. And he was from day one, he just never had a shy or nervous bone in his body. He was just um, a complete extrovert. And that sort of made him a lot more than my son, as well as the successes he had, especially through baseball. Um, he was more than just my son. He was my hero. You know, uh, a lot of kids look up to their dad, boys look up to their dad, but uh just his character sort of made him my hero. So mm. he was he was amazing. And he played baseball, right? ever. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, we just fell into T ball when he was uh, six or seven. Just some friends had played the previous season, and so he went along and he played a couple of seasons of T ball. And the second year they had a um, state championship. So from his local club, they made up a combined team. So he went along and he played that and he really enjoyed being in a higher level team, playing with good kids against some good competition. And the season finished, that championship finished. And uh, then for the next week, I kept coming home and he was in the carport and he was throwing a ball against the wall. And I thought, oh, you know, he's, he's really keen. So I drew a little chalk circle on the wall. And he just kept going. I thought initially, I thought, oh, it's just a bit of enthusiasm left over from the season, but you know, it'll wear off and now we're into footy season again. And it just kept going. And I said to him one day, oh, look, you know, if you're really keen and you want to keep practising, we can, um, you know, I can help you. We can practise through the winter. And um, that first season, he was sort of one of the average players in his, in that um, state championships team. And he, he was really keen. He did a little baseball introduction to baseball camp during the winter. He kept practising nearly every day all through football season and then he sort of it just morphed from there and it just kept building and growing um, and, you know, it became his passion and he said to me that he wanted to sort of do everything he could to be the best player he could be and see how far he could take it. So that sort of then gave me a new passion and, and uh, purpose. So, you know, over the next six years, Nearly every day we um, we practiced and uh, bought training aids from the US, a little pitching machine and paid for private lessons and did everything I could to help him. And he just, he was so determined and so had so much drive and he eventually got to the level where he represented Australia when he was 13, playing mm-hmm. in a World Series in America. So wow. uh, he was just, yeah, he had an incredible drive for, especially for a young kid, um, around 11 it's funny at, at a lot of the baseball camps and clinics, they always measure you know, three sort of indicators that measure bat speed, arm speed, and running speed. And he always was just naturally had a really strong arm. Mm. So he was always really high, uh, rated highly with his arm speed. His bat speed was good, but his running speed was terrible. Right. Um, one game, I remember he's running between <laughs> bases and another parent asked um, my ex-wife and I, has is, is he got a leg injury? Is something wrong? And we're like, no, that's just him. <laughs> just this gangly, doing his tall, gangly, awkward-looking running style. But then at 11, he started getting up early, setting his alarm. You know, it was cold in winter and he was going to the park and doing some sprints just off his own back. And I was mm. like, wow, I couldn't believe that an 11-year-old would do that. Um, but all that extra practice, you know, kids that just go to team training, they all sort of progress and improve at a similar level. But it was all the extra work that he did on his mm. own that um, got him to jump from an average T-ball player to um, have some amazing opportunities through baseball. Mm. It's quite incredible, you know, this 11-year-old getting themselves up and going to the park. Yeah. I myself have an 11-year-old and yeah. let's just say we haven't. We haven't picked that yet. <laughs> oh, no. My, my younger son uh, is completely different. He's a really sleepy head. So, yeah, getting him out of bed just to get to school on time is, is a struggle. So, yeah. yeah, they're just all different and, and that was, yeah, just a part of who Mitch was. Mm. So tell me about the accident. Yeah, well, um, he was 15 at the time and that, that day he was home. When I got home, he was home with two of his friends uh, it was about 7, 7.30 at night and he said it was a school holiday. So he said, um, we're going to a friend's house. And he said, oh, we're taking the friend lived on five acres and it's only about five, ten minutes walk from my place to some rural properties. And he said, oh, we're taking motorbikes. Uh, this other friend who owns the property, he's ridden motorbikes his whole life. So we're going to stay there that night and ride motorbikes the next day. So I'm thinking, oh, that's that's okay. It's on five acres. That's legal. 
Uh, so I didn't have a problem with him going. And he was walking his, as he's leaving, he had two, the two friends that were with him didn't have bikes. So they're walking. So I had no reason to think that he would ride his bike. Mm. Um, because I, I thought, you know, he wouldn't leave, or in hindsight, I've probably thought back and, uh, thought his two friends are walking. He wouldn't leave his friends. Mm. Uh, his friends have since told me that as teenagers do, he was, he was lying to me. He wasn't, they weren't never intended to go to the friend on the five acres. They were always going to go a couple of suburbs away to, um, some other friend's house. And apparently Mitch was always planning to go with the other two boys on the bus. Yeah. But at the last minute for uh, a reason that, you know, I've questioned a thousand times, he decided that he was going to ride his motorbike. And being 15, it was a dirt bike. It wasn't registered. Um, so he shouldn't have been obviously riding it on the road. And also being 15, he didn't have a license. Yeah. So I'm not naive thinking that he wasn't at fault. Um, of course, he was. if he hadn't have been there, if he hadn't have been doing the wrong thing, um, I wouldn't be here speaking to you to today. So he – but uh, on the flip side, you know, teenagers, they all take the piss, you know, whether it's stealing a few drinks, a few yeah. beers from Dad's fridge, lying to their parents, uh, trying drugs or <clears> – <throat> Wagon school, they all get up to something. Yeah. Uh, so, no, you know, an angel. yeah. So, you know, he, for whatever reason, he decided that he was going to ride his motorbike, you know. And as I said, I've questioned why a thousand times. I know he loved riding his motorbike. So maybe it was just as simple as that, that he wanted to ride his bike. Um, but, you know, I tried once he got the, he only had the bike just over a year. It was the first time he had a, ever had a motorbike. And, um, Again, when I was talking about my passion with doing things with my boys, uh, I, tr I got into it as well. I had the first time I ever ridden a bike was on Mitch's. I got myself a bike, got my license, got a motorbike trailer, researched different tracks around Perth and, and, um, tried to, you know, provide as many opportunities for him to legally ride, um, as I could. So, you know, I, I feel that I, I, yeah, I just didn't think that that was something that he would have done. Um, but anyway, so he rode their bike um, and about halfway to his friend's house, a group of guys in a car saw him and decided to chase him. Um, the driver's explanation to the police since was that he thought it was his stolen bike, which for my way of thinking, you know, Mitch turned into a street, they turned in, in behind him. Mm. So the only view of the bike that they would have had was the rear mudguard, a tyre, and yeah. uh, the you know the the back end of the exhaust. So there's to be a hundred percent sure that your stolen bike mm. is for me an extreme stretch. So as a result of um, there's also the fact that I still don't know to this day that bothers me is that I don't know how Mitch became aware that he was being chased. On the last street that he rode down, uh, some the witnesses' statement to the police said that he continually was looking behind him, mm. so he's well aware that he was being chased. Um, a car behind a motorbike, you a dirt bike, especially doesn't have rear view mirrors, so you, mm. you can't see directly behind you. And motorbike riders do do head checks; you check left and right, but you never check all things being normal directly yeah. behind you and a dirt bike's loud so you wouldn't hear. Yeah. So I don't know what was done that made him become aware that he was being chased. But as a, as a result of being chased, he he, um, he rode really fast to get and away. to get away and, um, you know, the last street that they went down, the, the CCTV footage, they estimate they were doing 75 in a, in a 50 zone. So that was really quick. And um, he came to a intersection and, you know, his attention was on the car chasing him. And I know anyone in stressful situations when your adrenaline starts pumping, you know, they say that your, the blood's diverted away from your frontal cortex, which is your decision-making parts of yeah. your brain. So his attention wasn't on the intersection and it was a giveaway sign and he rode through the intersection and hit the side of a car. Right. Um, and the car chasing him. 
chose not to stop and to leave. Uh, so that was, yeah, that was what happened. Mm. And then what happened after that? So after that, uh, a friend of Mitch's was uh, was going to meet up with him. She rang his mobile phone, and he, uh, uh, a person at the scene, so people that lived there heard the impact, and they came out to help him. He was unconscious. And he never never regained consciousness. Um, so she rang his his friend rang his phone, and somebody at the scene answered, and they were a teacher at his school, and they knew who he was. So they told uh, told her what had happened, and she came to my door and knocked on my door. So then I went to the scene um, and he was taken by ambulance to hospital. And, um, you know, they did, he had a lot of injuries. They uh, did a scan of his head, which was the worst. And uh, the when we got there, the, um, the doctor said to us that he either wasn't going to make it or be severely disabled. And the next day they did um, brain function tests. And he didn't respond to any of the tests and um, was pronounced brain dead. So we turned. Uh, we made the decision to turn off the machines, and he passed. Mm. Yeah. What um, What happened with the chasers? Yeah. Um, from the CCTV footage from a, a private residence had a CCTV, and uh, the police got the number plate of the car, so the person um, didn't hand themselves in. The police got their registration and uh, made the knock on their door. So the driver claimed that his uh, the people in the car were hitchhikers, but it was small suburban back streets, um, and the police didn't believe that. They tried with phone records to try and find out his accomplices in the car which they weren't able to. So the driver was charged with manslaughter, uh, failing to report an accident, failing to stop. And, and I said Mitch didn't have a licence, so obviously shouldn't have been on the road, but the driver also didn't have a licence. So he was right. charged with no driver's licence. So he also shouldn't have been there. And what happened to him? Well, let's see. I mean, the last, it's still ongoing, the court case. So he'll be, he pleaded guilty uh, about six weeks ago. So he'll be sentenced on the 12th of June. Um, so, you know, the last 17 months dealing, you know, family's been dealing with just horrific pain and grief and trauma, mm. uh, which on its own is just so say. difficult to get through. Uh, it's a daily battle. But then compounding on top of that, you've got the just enormous stress of, the what's what's happening with the you know uh, you're waiting for something to happen, waiting for this guy to be charged, and then I know they say the wheels of justice turn slowly, but you know by the t on the date that he'll be sentenced would been eighteen months since the accident, and there was there wasn't even a trial, and it's taken eighteen months. Uh, say for example, you know the accident was in December, the f the following May. He was charged in the January. So the following May, we got a letter. The police uh, had sent the file, the initial file, to the Department of um, Public Prosecutions as a as a serious charge. They were the ones prosecuting. Um, and then the next seven months, it took for just for the evidence to be transferred from the police department to the DPP. Uh, and it's not a complicated case. There was a couple of witness statements, the CCTV footage. You know, I've heard stories in the media recently about the Claremont serial killing where there was apparently, the media report said, over a million documents that they need to go through. Um, and this was quite simple. So we were just, uh, we didn't know why it was taking so long for just the evidence to be sent to the DPP. And um, the other frustrating part was, both the police and the DPP, we've, we've hardly received. All we wanted was just as parents was um, to be kept informed and barely received any calls. So it was us ringing them to find out what's going on mm. um, and then receiving, you know, misinformation. Initially the police said, oh, we've sent the evidence, but the DPP said they didn't get it all. Uh, the DPP said, no, they haven't sent everything. And the police said, you yeah, know, there was a mix-up. We're resending it. We're like, oh, you know, we've lost a son. Mm. 
All we want is to be kept informed and some honesty about what's going on. Um, so once the DPP got all the evidence, uh, the defence lawyer sent a submission, uh, a which I think is a must be a common thing. They all try their hand at saying we'll plead guilty if you drop the charges to dangerous driving causing death. And the, D the director of the DPP had a meeting with us and said definitely not after his admissions in his police statement. Um, it's definitely enough, shows enough of his mental intent at the time of the chase. Uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, so they went with the manslaughter charge and the defendant then pleaded guilty. So now we're just waiting for the sentencing. Mm. But, yeah, really traumatic just, as I said, just waiting. You've got the grief and then, you know, there's a court listing at the end of each month so then you get anxious thinking what's happening, is something going to happen this time? Um, nothing happens, it's adjourned again and then you're, you know, anger and frustration and then you're waiting another month and it builds up again and this goes for 18 months and it's just a huge stress in the background. Mm. Um, you know, I tried hard just to think this is a situation that I've got. I can have no input on, no control, just try and accept that whatever happens will happen. Um, but it's still there just in the background, just ticking away and, and uh, you know, you don't even realise, but it's just adding stress, um, which, like I said, the grief was difficult enough, is difficult enough to deal with on its own, to have that mm -hmm. in the background. And um, I know if Mitch had just had, if it had just been purely an accident, of course, the grief and the sadness would be Isolated just as much. To that, yeah. But to know that he was forced to speed um, and it wasn't purely an accident uh, just yeah, makes it all the more frustrating and, mm. and difficult to deal with. What um, I'm going to ask you about your own personal grief related to Mitch in a second, but what sort of closure do you think you'll get when is when there is the sentence? Yeah, a lot of people have said that of that once it's all finished, that it will provide some closure. But yeah, I just I've thought about it, and I don't really know what what does that mean. What does closure mean? Yeah, um, I think since the because up until the guilty plea, it was just really a thousand what if questions. What if there's a trial? What if the defence lawyer? attacks Mitch's character, as you see on TV and movies. Mm. Um, it's your son that's been attacked. Though, yeah, yeah, and I thought, oh, that would be horrific. And even just um, confronting the defendant at court appearances, which those two-minute adjournments was just traumatic enough. Um, but to go through a three-, four-day trial would have been horrific. So I don't – it. I, once it's completed, it won't make any difference to my – grief or sadness or make me feel a little happier, all it will do will just remove that background stress of that court case hanging around in the mm. background. And uh, another part of that stress over the court or over someone being charged is the defendant lives in my suburb, so it's five minutes away, um, right. which is causes a lot of stress. Uh, you know, going to him, just going to the shops, you know, just scanning faces, thinking, oh, I'm not going to bump into him, uh, which is, which happened once. Um, so just, it'll just remove a lot of stress. I don't think there'll be any closure. I suppose even, you know, it doesn't even matter what the sentence is. Mm. Uh, you know, um, if it's three years, if it's 10 years, I don't think that'll make any difference to how I feel. Um, because it it's irrelevant and it won't bring Mitch back. Um, mm. But I suppose at least there has been some justice uh, that, you know, alternatively if they'd never found the car, if they'd never found the person, then I'd be scanning faces at the shops thinking, is that the guy? Uh, mm. that, that I'd, it'd go on for the rest of my life, just what if, who was it, what happened? Mm. So at least... Maybe that is a little bit of closure that we know most of the details of what happened. Um, and someone is going to be held accountable. Mitch paid the ultimate price for his mistakes that day. Um, you know, I said earlier about teenagers 
make stupid mistakes. So he did make a silly mistake in a typical teenage mistake. He shouldn't have been there. Um, but I think he deserved to learn from his mistakes. He deserved for, you know, at best the police to catch him, confiscate his bike, us as parents to kick his butt um, and sell the bike. He didn't deserve to die mm. for his mistakes. He paid the ultimate price for his mistakes. So the um, the offender charged with manslaughter needs to now face the consequences of his actions as well. Tell me about your journey since then. Yeah. Um, of course, just through the course of my life, you know, just the same as everyone, you have ups and downs, failures, uh, doubts, but just uh, I've had, you know, family members pass away as well. Uh, I only had uh, sort of was really close with one grandparent my whole life, but when she passed away, uh, there, of course, there was some grief and, you know, other situations in life cause stress and but just absolutely nothing comes close to to what I've experienced since losing Mitch. Like I said, he was... Um, he was more than just my son. He was my hero and everything he got involved with, you know, uh, we were really similar in our interests. You know, the, I got into the motorbikes when he got into it and the and the sports. We did some Muay Thai together, yeah. um, camping, and we were just good mates as well. Uh, so just horrific, the, the pain and um, early on just, you know, losing the will to sort of even just washing the dishes. I just thought, oh, I can't handle this. I can't, what's the point? Why bother doing the housework? Um, it's just horrific suffering. And, um, yeah, that's sort of, I mean, now being almost 18 months since his accident, there's still moments. It's not as intense, of course, um, but there's still moments every day when I think about the fact that I'll never see him again and it just really still smacks you in the face. And um, I think I'll always be, there'll always be a part of me that's in denial that I won't see him again. Uh, I don't think I'll ever fully uh, accept the fact that I won't, you know, he was only 15. I can't fully accept the fact that he's gone. Um, but, yeah, so the first five months, it was just a huge void. Uh, 18 months before Mitch's accident, I went through a divorce, which was um, traumatic on its own. But... Um, my younger son, Blake, was we shared custody. He was 50-50. And um, because I was still in the house that Mitch had grown up in, uh, he decided just to stay with me 90% of the time. He had, you know, all his stuff there, his mates close by, his bedroom. Uh, so that was a real comfort for me because mm. he was there and uh, he was he was only 15, but he was always looking out for me. And then uh, the motivation and inspiration that I tried to use on him when he was through his baseball journey he then turned, flipped it over and uh, turned it back on me. So he really uh, got me up and enjoying life again. And like I said, we were going camping and motorbike riding. So uh, he was a huge part of my life. And, yeah, to lose him that that first five months was, was horrific. I mean, longer than that. But then, um, you know, after after that first five months, I sort of, um, I was thinking that, you know, I'd like to share his stories of the drive and the lack of fear and how he sort of chased his dreams and his passions and how that led to great successes through his life, with his, especially his baseball. Um, so I sort of got the idea of, of writing a book about five months after the accident hmm. and uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I still don't. And uh, it's almost finished. I still don't know what I'm doing. But I hadn't written anything since high school. And even then it was a, you know, you had to write two pages. I thought, yeah. I can't be bothered doing this. Had no interest. Um, since then all I'd written was a couple of emails for work. Um, I, th I just thought no, I'd like to share his stories. And then also as well as trying to in inspire and motivate other people with the, you know, to chase their dreams and follow their passions like Mitch did, I thought maybe my journey through grief and an example of trying to do something positive after something so traumatic, then I hope that would 
that would help other people with, you know, if they're struggling with grief or not just grief but adversity or, you know, everyone has their struggles. So, yeah, hoping that maybe my journey through uh, my story of my journey through grief would um, be able to hopefully help somebody. If it does help some, you know, anyone or one person just a little bit, then it'll be worth it. Um, we, said, we said in the introduction about how something like that could have turned your heart to stone. Yeah. And instead you've gone the other way. Was there a tipping point in there when that um, occurred? Yeah, I don't think it was it was one moment or one point, but just um, just the outpouring of support and love and generosity and help from so many people. Just, of course, friends and family, but um, just acquaintances that weren't maybe so such close friends, and still, just to this day, it's incredible the the different sources and where the supports come from. And just that receiving so much love and support was one of the main things that helped with my grief. Um, so, and so I thought, you know, it's helped me so much. Mm. If I can provide some form of support or uh, to others, then, you know, that would be uh, a new sort of purpose. And um, it's tricky to receive help sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, everyone's different. Some people, of course, you know, close up and go into their shell. But um, I've always, for whatever reason, just been more open. I, You know, uh, when I'm really struggling, you know, I ring people in my support network and, uh, you know, um, they, you know, that's, that's one of the greatest helps, just the love and support of others. But... Um, the other, the other part of it as well is, yeah, that, that's one part is I, it helped me so much with so much love and support. So now I think if I could be that for somebody else or through the book or through my Facebook pages, if any of my little, um, blurbs or random ramblings can help anybody, then, then and that'd, uh, you know, feel really, uh, make me feel good mm. as well. But then also I think a lot of people, you know, we, we see a, a lifetime of pain and suffering and war and poverty and horror on the news, a whole lifetime of that sort of can you leave you desensitised to other people's suffering. Mm. Uh, you just see it so much. Um, really, if you, if you hadn't experienced that your whole life and you watched the news story and saw, say, the poverty in Africa or uh you know, the famine in Africa or poverty in, in other countries would be horrific, but we've we've just been bombarded by so much of it our whole lives that I, I don't even watch the news for that reason now because mm. we just desensitise it. Even, you know, some horrific terrorist acts, you just think, oh, that's terrible, and then you just go about your daily lives. It doesn't really, that pain and suffering that you see uh, doesn't, well, for me, I think it's mm. similar for a lot of people, Uh doesn't deeply affect you, but they're now going through so much trauma from losing Mitch um, has really opened my heart to um, wanting to help and assist others. So what, if, if you boil it down, what, what are some of the key messages that you're trying to get across with with the book and with the phone? Yeah, probably uh, as I've mentioned, like with Mitch, he just – he had a passion and he went all in and he gave it 100%. And that can uh, lead to great successes. And I think a lot of people, especially when you become an adult, you get uh, caught up with the daily routine and the grind of life and going through the motions and the work, pay your bills, uh, merry-go-round that we all get on can sometimes snowball and your dreams and passions are, are pushed to the wayside and, mm. there, and there's no time to fit them in. And I know Mitch was only a kid and kids just generally spend most of their time doing what they enjoy. But I think that's one message that um, can be useful to remind people to not give up on your dreams. And then Mitch's example that he was just an average T-ball player, but he put in so much hard work and he achieved his dreams. 
And then um, I think another aspect that prevents people from chasing their dreams is fear. You know, everyone's feared of tr- fear of something new, tr- uh, starting something, the fear of failure. Um, so one example, the last 18 months, we, um, we started doing Muay Thai together. It was Thai boxing with knees, elbows, kicks, all that type mm. of thing. It was one of the most brutal um, combat sports. And one day the gym had boxers come in to fight in a proper proper fight, but just as a training fight against the Muay Thai guys. So mm. Mitch only did the Muay Thai. He was 15. He just went along to, along to watch. He wasn't scheduled to, to fight anybody. So one of the Muay Thai guys has seen the boxer. He's planning to fight, uh, warming up, and he thought, oh, just he looks a bit too fit, a bit too good, and he backed out. Uh, so Mitch is just there in his casual clothes. Someone said, Mitch, this guy, the boxer, was 19 and was just a pure boxer. Mitch was only 15. So Mitch, do you want to jump in? He's like, yeah, no worries. So I thought, there's no way in the world at 15 yeah. I would have jumped in. Just no fear. He borrowed some gear from others, jumped in. He came home and he said, Dad, Dad, I almost got knocked out. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he said, this guy, the boxer just, he said they clinched at one stage and they pulled over the ref separated and Mitch dropped his hands. The guy clocked him straight in the head and Mitch said he was dazed. He'd never sort of been hit like that before and felt dazed. Yeah. And, you know, the, the ref said, you want to keep going? He's like, yeah. And I just thought, wow, that's just that lack of fear. Mm. So many of us think, oh, don't try, don't give it a go because you, you're scared of something. So I try and get that across as some of the messages from Mitch. Um Another example of him just going all in with uh, a few months before his accident, uh, a friend's parents bought a speedboat. So they took Mitch and his mates, you know, wakeboarding down south. Mm. So the day of his accident, I got three text messages with link to Gumtree speedboat for sale. I said, mate, seriously, I'm not buying a speedboat. But he's just, you know, something he enjoyed and he went all in. He, he chased his dreams. and yeah. So that's, that's one message. And then... Um, just through my journey, just um, that strength that Mitch showed, especially sort of like that that boxing example, um, you know, that a lot of people talk about, you know, maybe being born within a strength or um, developing in a strength. But sort of just through my journey through grief, it just got me thinking that is, is it something you can build? Is it something you're born with? Or is it just something that... Is it just your internal beliefs? Mm. I don't believe, you know, some people might be, this is uh, this is too traumatic. I don't have the strength to deal with it. And that becomes their reality. Whereas mm. early on I thought, you know, Mitch was so strong. Um, I'm going to make the conscious decision, especially say I wanted to do his uh, eulogy really well at his funeral. Uh, I, th- said, I thought he was strong. I'm going to be strong. So I think maybe it was more, my conscious decision to be strong, that led to me showing strength. And then each, you know, say with his eulogy or other events that have taken place, then with each of those that I... The ability to talk about it now. Yeah, with each of those that I've displayed strength, then it's reinforced that new internal belief. So, you know, for people out there that... I I might be completely wrong, but... um, and maybe that will resonate with people that, you know, just stuck in that mindset that they don't have the strength to deal with a situation. Maybe it is just your internal beliefs that if you can change that around and, and make that decision, that conscious decision that I'm going to be strong from now on, then with each situation that you display strength, it just builds momentum and reinforces that belief system. Um, so, you know, talk about that, just talk about the different aspects of grief that, you know, I've, I've found difficult and the things that I, I mean, I'm not obviously trained as a counsellor or a psychologist, but just relaying my experiences. So hopefully that will, um, will assist people. Mm. And then just, you know, there's some other lessons that just, you know, with every situation in life, especially negative situations can provide the greatest lessons. So, mm. uh, as I said before, I'd give every lesson back just to be able to have Mitch back, but trying to take some lessons from him, especially mm. as I said about just, you know, giving everything a shot. You just, and of course. So how have you changed life? 
since then, taking those lessons up? Or? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I don't think I, I had a great deal of strength when I was younger, um, but, yeah, I think, you know, it has built some more strength within me. And then, like I said, being a dad was my main passion and purpose. And, I, of course, I still am with my youngest son, Blake, um, but now it's sort of developed a new passion and purpose to hopefully help others. Mm. And, um, I mean, I'm, I'm I only sell five books, so, uh, but I've also decided that not just helping people with, who read the book, but then through my Facebook page, um, hopefully some of the stuff that I post on there might be useful. But then also with the sales of the book, I've uh, also announced that I'm going to give $1 from each book to a local charity that's assisted me a lot since um, the accident. Um, about a week after the accident, a huge food hamper turned up, one for myself and one for my ex-wife, Denise. Um, and I had no idea where it had come from, but um, it was just a couple of local guys that set up a charity for the, you know, with a lot of different community services. Um, and they provide, provided me with a food hamper. So I thought, wow, that's fantastic. So I got to know the guys and genuine guys. It's not uh, the case with some charities where there's big CEOs taking huge wages from the donations or only small percentage of donations going to the actual intended mm. cause. There's some genuine guys just with, you know, the um, motivation of providing services for the for the betterment of the community. Um, so I'm going to give a dollar from each book to them. And then um, I'm also hoping in the future, again, depending on the, on the book sales, if I can uh, get some enough dollars, then I'll also look into, you know, I helped Mitch pursue his dream. So hopefully I can also set up a grant for to help other um, teenagers chase their dreams. But, yeah, so getting back to your question of how I've changed. So, yeah, it's just really instilled in me. Um, and I think there's it just seems no better feeling than to be able to help others. Mm. Um, you know, Sure, buying a new car or a new TV might give you a small little spike in happiness, but for long-term happiness, you know, I've probably, yeah, this has made me consider and think about what is happiness. Um, will I be able to be happy again? Ways to try and find happiness in my life now. And um, for me, helping others really, you know, is a, is a great feeling, so that's, that's one major change since the accident is that um, new purpose of trying to assist others. Do you find, um, because we're trying to get this message out, and your message has come from a um, you know, very traumatic event, which has turned into a wake-up call to all of this, to yeah. all of this and really make you think about it, reflect on it, and act on it at a very deeper level. Do you find yourself look, looking at those around you and almost wanting to shake them to wake up to all of this? Because it's it's it can be difficult to get a um, it can be difficult to get these messages across to people, yeah, unless they've actually had their own wake up call, whatever yeah, that sure. may have looked like. Yeah, I think uh, one aspect that um, where that. Ring, rings really true is you see quite often you'll see um, or hear stories of maybe someone's been diagnosed with a um, terminal illness and say the last two years of their life or, or whatever period they've got left, they they really actively chase all their dreams, go on those trips that they wanted to go on, um, you know, tick off their bucket list, whatever you want to call it, goals, dreams, bucket list. Um, or, yeah, people may have, say, with Mitch's example, they might lose someone really close to them, and that might be the wake-up call that galvanises them to chase their dreams and mm. um, do the things that they're passionate about with their life. Um, and I think, like I said earlier, sometimes, yeah, you get you get in a rut. and um, But, yeah, it's really made me realise that, you know, Mitch was, there's no guarantees that tomorrow's going to come. Uh, everyone, nobody thinks it's going to happen to them, especially Mitch was fit and healthy and active and loved life. 
uh, was only 15, he would have thought he had 70, 80 years left to tick off all his goals and dreams if he hadn't have spent every day chasing his dreams and doing what he loved. If he was putting them off, then he would have passed without having lived an amazing life. Mm. And we all think we've got, depending on your age, 10, 20, 30 years, nobody thinks that there's going to be an accident tomorrow or you're going to go to the doctor and the test results are going to come back and, you know, and it's going to not be a positive outcome. Nobody think that, thinks that's going to happen to them. Mm. But those incidents, yeah, can sometimes um, galvanise people to get busy on doing the things that they want to achieve. Mm. And, yeah, so I sort of hope that maybe Mitch's, you know, um, Mitch's death, um, my book or Facebook page will make people realise that you only get this one life, so there's no guarantees of tomorrow. So mm. get busy chasing your dreams, do what you're passionate about, Um of course, you have to take care of your responsibilities, but mm. uh, make sure that there's an even balance in life of responsibilities and doing the things that you really want to do uh, and, and start today, start ticking off those bucket list items. Mm. Uh, if you've spent the last 10 years sitting on the fence, procrastinating, thinking, one day I'm going to get to go on that dream trip, Tomorrow might not come. Mm. Book it today. Book it today. Get started. Get busy. So, yeah, that's one message that I hope comes across. Have you had much feedback yet from the outside world in terms of people taking this on? Uh, not so much in terms of chasing their dreams. Um, I have had um, some messages from other people that are suffering with grief. Um, and like I said, I... I don't pretend to have any formal training or answers to mm. people's grief, but I hope that maybe just me there being someone for them to talk to, connect with in whichever form, hopefully that's just like for me, sometimes the best is is not anything that somebody can say, but just being able to pour out your story and talk to somebody. So hopefully that has helped people and yeah, I don't try to give people any answers, just be an ear for them to listen to. Or if it's a particular issue, just say, oh, look, you know, I, I suffered with a similar thing and mm. this is what I experienced and this is what helped me. may not help you, but, um, yeah. So that's, yeah, a really positive, uh, amazing thing from, you know, to get these messages from all over the world. Uh, I've spoken to a lady in Florida a couple of times. You're like, wow, that's incredible how you can connect mm. and, People are with, you know, suffering with similar stories. So, yeah, like I said, if it can just help someone in that, even if it's just that one little moment, just have a little five minute uh, Facebook chat. And if that helps just get over that little one moment, then, you know, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a fantastic feeling to, th to think that, uh, you can positively, um, help somebody. Mm. How has this, changed your relationship with your younger son you know uh, me thinking this through i can see how you'd want to cling on to him and wrap him in cotton wool and, yeah and, and and stuff like that but then that's not going to help him to flourish and go off and be a teenager and all of that sort of stuff yeah um yeah it's it's they they were both completely polar opposite kids like i said um Mitch was um, never had a, you know, it was an extreme extrovert when mm. Blake is a little more quiet and shy. Um, but, and, yeah, when he was younger, he, he was, Blake was always a little scared to try new things. But mm. for some reason, since about the age of seven, he's 13 now, he's, he's sort of taken off and, and really liked all these action and adventure type activities. So I don't know if it's changed our relationship a great deal but and yeah i don't cling too tightly i let him mm. explore but just having him and doing those activities with him is as you know given me 
another purpose and you know it was always my purpose with the boys of course but um just give me a reason especially early on to keep going when mm. you think i can't deal with this so it, yeah having him's helped a lot i don't know if it's yeah changed our relationship a great deal mm. and i do still you know as he gets older let him have more freedom and try to help him grow and develop but of course, you now you're not divided between two. And Mitch was so full on with take me motorbike riding, fishing, camping. Uh, he was such a, a time drain that Blake might have um, might have missed out a little bit um, early on when I went to the coroner's court offered free counselling services. So um, I was talking about the differences with the counsellor about the two boys, Mitch being such an extrovert. Uh, and such the centre of attention, whereas Blake always being really quiet and shy. Mm. And she said it's quite common, especially with a high-achieving older child, for them to cast a big shadow and not much like mm. it through to the younger child. Um, and whether it's him getting, I mean, always try to be mindful of that and give him the uh, equal amount of time and attention. And whether it might just be the growing up and getting older not necessarily maybe Mitch's accent now getting more attention, but, yeah, he's, he's sort of really flourished uh, in the last couple of years. Mm. So that's that's been good and positive. What does the next three to five years hold for you? Um, well, I suppose um, yeah, who knows, really? Like uh, two, <laughs> two years ago, three years ago, I was – Married, there was two kids. It was, you know, you come home from work and it's a family environment. And then having two kids, they're doing all these activities and these kids bombing in and out of the house. And I never would have thought that three years down the track, uh, that my wife wouldn't be there anymore. And my oldest son wouldn't be around. And then when it's Blake's uh, week with his mum, then it's just me. And you just think, how did I get to this point? So, that's one thing I realised that you never know what's happening tomorrow. So who knows what will happen in another year, let alone three yeah. or five. But I do sort of – and then, yeah, writing a book was not something that I ever thought I'd do. Um, so, yeah, I'm hoping that things will maybe progress along the line with the, with the social media stuff and the book and just see what avenues that opens up and, and what other – Areas that I can, you know, early on was just the book idea and then I got the idea of, you know, giving a dollar from each book to the charity and then I sort of, uh, you know, like I said, thinking about everything I did to motivate and help Mitch and then I got the idea about maybe setting up a grant. So hopefully that will just morph into more um, different areas of being able to help others. Mm. See what, who knows, who thought I'd ever be on a podcast? <laughs> There you, go. you know what I mean? You just uh, all these things that have happened. You just think you might plan and have this direction and plan for your life, and and that's one of the opening paragraphs in my book. That life's just constantly changing. Every moment's different from the last, mm. and holding on to the past, trying to hold on to the past, or not accepting change can then cause uh, you know problems. Um, yeah, these, it's sort of to navigate through life, you, you need to be able to adapt and accept constant change. So. And there may be a bigger plan that we're unaware of. Who knows? <laughs> Indeed. How do you uh, keep yourself grounded through all of this? Um, in what respect? Do you know? So it, I imagine it'd be quite easy to disappear off into your head or... Or something like that. What do you do to nowadays to just keep yourself grounded and bring yourself back to yourself and be present? Yeah. You mean thoughts just say throughout the day? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, of you know, course, through the every day, I, I don't think mm. I go two minutes without thinking about Mitch and mm. um, everything that's happened. And, you know, I've read a little bit about present moment awareness, you know, uh, Buddhist teachings of present moment awareness. And, yeah, difficult to great in theory, but, mm. you know, I try. I try to stay present. Mm. Um, 
yeah, just yeah, that's something I probably do struggle with is is how to control my own thought streams. You know, they just run off. And say for an example, especially early on in the grief process, you your mind would start thinking about the most horrific aspects, maybe seeing the moment that Mitch passed or seeing him at the viewing or at the accident scene. And, um, I, you know, I'd heard this, um, psychological, uh, theory or, or practice of, um, you know, sort of noticing when you, you're going off on those thoughts. I can't remember what it's called actually at the moment. And then trying to cut yourself off and thinking it, realize that you're snowballing, you're going down some rabbit yeah, hole. Where you're going now. Yeah. And just think, oh, hang on, I'm doing that again and cutting yourself off. So, um, when Mitch played baseball in the, there was a 2015, um, national championships and mm-hmm. his team from WA were playing it. and they were playing on the main diamond and it was tele- televised and uh, so sort of through stream through the internet. And so there was a YouTube clip of he hit home run and, you know, I'd watched that previous to his accident so many times that I'd memorised that. It's only a 30-second clip, memorised the commentary on Mitch hitting the home run. So when I noticed I was going down those little rabbit holes, I tried to cut myself off and, and start repeating start like that. a positive – memory of Mitch so that um, then my thoughts, not all my thoughts about Mitch during that time were grief related or traumatic and mm. because then you you don't want to be thinking traumatic, horrible thoughts all the time um, at all. So I didn't want those to be all my thoughts about Mitch. I wanted to uh, and I didn't want to then cut myself off from thinking about Mitch because of all those traumatic thoughts. I wanted to keep thinking about him but make my memories mm. and thoughts about him positive ones. So, you know, I tried to employ that technique. Mm. But, yeah, day to day, um, it's an interesting still point at the moment. Because it gets easy when we lose a loved one to not think about them because the thinking about them gets hurts too much. in so much pain and hurt. Yeah. And so they almost, through no fault of their own, start to disappear from us. Yeah. Because we shroud their memory and it, and it's punching through that to celebrate them. And, yeah. And, 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 and instead of shrouding it in negativity, shroud that in greatness yeah, and light and, and love. and Yeah, positivity and and just reinforce those positive memories mm. or try and you know, notice that you're going down that path and cut it off if you can and force yourself to, to think about something. Uh, another part of his personality that I didn't mention was just it's just the ultimate character. It was just humour. Every opportunity for a, a prank, a joke, a stitch mm. up. Uh, so there's so many, you know, funny stories and you're thinking about those or, um, yeah, because some of that other stuff is just so horrific. Um, you know, nobody thinks that their own child will pass away, mm. but to see it happen in front of your eyes, is just, uh, it's, you know, you would never describe even before, you know, you might see a story about somebody losing a child and you have your kids and you love your kids and you think, Oh, that'd be traumatic, but it just, um, doesn't come close, you know, how you think that it might feel in mean, no way comes close to how it actually feels. Mm. Um, it's just so painful and so traumatic. Um, and, yeah, those those thoughts sometimes creep in. Mm. Um, and just, yeah, for your own, as well, you know, not just to forget about their memory, as you were saying, but just for your own peace of mind because if too much of that stuff is uh, rattling around too often, you yes. know, you could, could short circuit at some stage. So, mm. um, yeah, I try, try to bring myself back to, uh, the humor or the, the achievements or the great times that we had. Hmm. Hmm. So if you, 
I often ask people at the, towards the end if you could go back to a particular point and give yourself a piece of advice. What would that? Yeah. What would that be? I guess it's if you could go back. I feel like in this, you've already come out with the advice, which is you know, take every opportunity, pursue your dreams, stay strong, and this, that, and the other. If you could go back to a point in life and learn this lesson a bit earlier, when would it have been? Yeah, um, I suppose it would all resolve uh, revolve around doing what I could to prevent the accident mm. so I'd still have Mitch in my life. And, yeah, there's a million different thoughts that have gone through my head the last 18 months about how it happened, why it happened, what I could have, the guilt over what I could have done differently, um, whether any of that would have made a difference, whether it was just him taking the piss as a teenager's do, like we spoke about before, Um but I think, you know, when I was a teenager, all I wanted was more freedom. And maybe I allowed Mitch too much freedom because that's what I wanted. I didn't want to be restrict his freedom. Hmm. Um, maybe, you know, I could go on for hours about the things that I wish I could have done differently. Hmm. Um, or maybe realised, you know, that... You know, it was a couple, uh, it was, like I said, it was after my wife and I separated that we agreed that he could get a motorbike. I know, I don't know where he got the idea from, but it was a few years before that he started banging on about wanting one. Um, and he loved it and he loved riding. Um, but of course, if I could go back, I'd say, no, you can't have a motorbike. Yeah. Just the, you know, if um, a lot of other things in life, if things go wrong, the consequences aren't as grave as mm. going wrong at high speed on a motorbike. Um, but he loved the bike and he loved riding. Um, so to, yeah, of course, I'd, you know, if it meant having Mitch mm. and him being grumpy about not having a motorbike, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd do that. But, you know, then what lengths do you go to? Say, no, you can't go body surfing or surfing because you, yeah, yeah, you might break your neck. Your head or yeah. A shark might eat you. Uh, you, could, you could leave them inside wrapped in bubble wrap and they'd live to 95, but what what life would they have? Would yeah. they enjoy? He'll, uh, you know, we, we let him have some freedom and we let him chase all his dreams and we gave him all those opportunities um, and we did get him the motorbike towards the end, but... He loved every minute and he had an amazing life, you mm. know, provided those so many different international trips for his baseball. Um, of course, I'd, t I'd take it back to have him here. Mm. But I am conflicted because, of course, I want him here mm. and would, you know, take away his motorbike. But then on the flip side, I think, would I want him to have not enjoyed life as much as he did? So... It's rough. Um, of course, that night maybe I should have said, mm. I'll hitch up the trailer or put your bike on the trailer, take you to your friend's house. Yeah. Um, but being only just five minutes walk, you know. Pushing the bike. Yeah. Uh, at yeah. seven at night maybe, maybe uh, you know, it's just that guilt, yeah. that, that thousand guilty thoughts of guilt, mm. you, you know, but... Yeah, and is, you could go. Are back. they now part of those thoughts that you stop off? Try to push away. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know it's it's all great in theory, but all those thought they still still rear their head mm. regularly. Um, so it's a uh, like I was talking about the decision to be strong. It's not a one time decision. You know, it's mm. it's a daily decision, and sometimes it's moment by moment. And you know, all those thoughts that you try and push away. Um, it works to some degree at some stage, but, you know, it's all good in theory sometimes. You know, sometimes it still doesn't help. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you just have to grit your teeth and push through, but you just got to keep trying, you know. So uh, I know my, that's what Mitch would want, so yeah. I'll just keep trying. Wayne, I have to admire your bravery to come and oh, talk today. 
and and thank you as well for sharing your oh, thanks for having me your journey it's been absolutely fascinating to listen to and and i thank you for your openness honesty honesty your vulnerability and the rawness of the story i think there's so much in there to learn from so thanks well, thank you very much no for worries. thanks for having me thank again. you no worries.